So we want to move now and start talking about a new a new topic, and, and that's going to be dynamic finite element modeling. And to begin with, we're going to uh, just introduce the idea of natural frequencies um, and modes. So let me ask first the question, um, when is a dynamic problem dynamic? Well, let's consider two cases. We'll start the first uh, for cyclic loading. And in the case of cyclic loading, uh, if the frequency of the loading is um, less than about a quarter of the structure's lowest natural frequency, uh, then we could typically would say that the dynamic effects uh, don't play a large role. So in, in that case, uh, you would go ahead and you're going to consider uh, the model as quasi-static. So you don't need to run a dynamic loading. And this is something that I think you probably know intuitively, right? If I if I put a, a dog bone specimen in an Instron and I load it up, let's say every 10 seconds I'm I'm uh, changing the loading direction, I don't think anybody would think that that's truly a dynamic problem, even though of course the the load is time dependent, right? Uh, and that's because that the lowest natural frequency um, is is uh, much higher than the loading that we're that we're um, applying. So so because our loading is le way less than 25% of the structure's lowest natural frequency, um, we just don't expect dynamics to play a role. Okay, similarly, um, uh, for, a, for let's say a monotonic loading, um, if the time of the loading is going to be greater than about four times of the period of the, of the um, lowest natural frequency, Right, so remember we can write that the period t is equal just to one over the frequency, right? So if if our uh, time of loading is significantly greater than that, then we also could consider it as quasi-statics. Okay, so uh, just with this this basic uh, description, you can clearly see that obviously the the natural frequency of the system is important, uh, or the or the natural frequencies. Um, so. So, so now we want to, um, so what we've shown here is that clearly the natural frequencies of the system are important. And, and, and on the practical side, um, it's actually a, a good idea, and sometimes it's required in the FEA code, to conduct um, a frequency or a mode shape analysis prior to running any dynamic analysis. It depends on the kind of dynamic analysis that you're running. But it's always a good idea so you at least know uh, what your frequencies are, so you, you know when you, when you can um, uh, maybe ignore dynamic effects or when you need to incorporate them. Okay, so if that's the case, we want to, um, we know that they're important, we know why they're important now, uh, uh, we know that we probably should look at the natural frequencies before we even run a dynamic analysis, how do we compute the natural frequencies um, and the associated mode shapes? So let's ask that question next. Here's our question. How do we compute the natural frequencies uh, and the associated mode shapes of the system? So in typical fashion, um, we're going to begin with a 1D example, and then we're going to try to use that uh, in parallel to extend to a 3D example, okay? Okay, so here's our 1D example, and we're going to consider the natural frequency of a single spring mass system. So let's go ahead and draw a picture. So here's our uh, where our spring is going to be attached. It's going to be attached to some mass. We'll call the mass M spring constant k and we'll go ahead and define from the wherever the mass hangs down we'll define that as uh, we'll say that that's u okay and we know uh, we have uh, Newton's uh, second law what's Newton's second law says it says f is equal to m a right a must be u double dot so it's m u double dot and then what does F look like well, if I if I give u a positive direction, then my my force is actually going to be in the negative direction, and it's going to be uh, negative k times u. Okay, and that gives me my governing differential equation, uh, m u double dot plus uh, k u is equal to zero. We'll call that equation one. So you'll see it's a homogeneous second-order differential equation with constant coefficients. 
Um, we, we, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just put it in a little bit of a different form. Uh, I'm going to multiply by uh, 1 over m or m inverse. Right, I'm left with u double dot is equal to uh, plus m inverse times k times u uh, equals 0. Okay, call that equation 2. I left it in this kind of weird form because we're going to see a nice parallel when we go to 3D uh, with respect to that. So uh, since both m and k are positive, then, then m inverse times k also positive, so I can assign it some constant value that's always positive. So we can introduce this variable, we'll call it omega squared, and we'll say that that's equal to m inverse times k, or you're more familiar with k over m. Okay, something like that. Call that equation three. We'll go ahead and substitute equation three into equation two. U double dot plus omega squared times U is equal to zero. Call that equation four. So now we just go ahead and proceed with our uh, conventional solution for this type of equation. We're gonna assume a solution of the form uh, U is equal to E to the RT, right? Uh, to get uh, the characteristic equation, uh, which is uh, r squared plus omega squared is equal to zero. Hopefully this is all review to you. Okay, so solving for r uh, gives us that r is equal to plus or minus i omega. Call that equation six. And then uh, now we're going to go ahead and use Euler's formula which if you remember said e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta, right? That's the Euler's formula. So we're gonna use that and we're also gonna note that we're only concerned with the real part of this solution, right? Okay, we can go ahead and write uh, the solution with some, uh, with, with some constants obviously as follows. Let's call that equation seven, okay? So it's like u uh, is, a, is equal to a, some, some uh, unknown coefficient, times cosine of omega t plus b times sine of omega t. Uh, obviously, this is a homogeneous solution only, but we only had a homogeneous problem, so we don't need to incorporate the particular solution here. Um, so what can we say about this solution? Well, the specific values of a and b are, gonna, of course, going to depend on the initial conditions. Okay, but, but regardless of what a and b is equal to, what we can tell is that the mass is going to oscillate because that's given, that's what U is telling us, uh, with some frequency that's given by omega, right? So, but regardless, the mass oscillates with the frequency given by omega. And I'll just say that, that um, uh, omega is going to be in radians per second, right? Uh, or, uh, if you want, it'll it, we could write f the frequency, uh, which is w in in cyclic frequency, which will be equal to omega divided by two pi, right? And then then that will be in hertz cycles per second, right? We'll call this equation eight, okay? And in equation eight, uh, either omega or f uh, is referred to as the natural frequency of the system. Why is that? Well, it's because that's the frequency at which it naturally oscillates, right? Um, okay, so so what else can we say? Well, we we now kind of have a little bit of a, uh, a sense for how the natural frequency comes about. We agree that if I were to uh, just sort of pull on the system and let it go, that that's the frequency that it's going to oscillate at. So that's one part of the um, the dynamic problem that we care about with respect to um, finite element analysis. Um, but but uh, in, a, in this sort of 1D spring mass system, um, we, don't, we aren't able to, to make a parallel to mode shapes, okay? Uh, because there's no, there's no spatial dependence of, of our variable u, okay? So let me, let me write that down. Okay, uh, so I thought about maybe uh, working through this problem with a spatial dependence, uh, maybe for something like uh, 
a vibrating string or something like that. Um, but because uh, partial differential equations isn't required for this class, I'm going to go ahead and skip that. I'll just jump right to um, uh, the, the FEA solution. So, uh, so let's go ahead and turn to that 3D case. Um, with some sort of a discretized FEA system. Okay, and in that case, uh, we have, we, let's go back to our governing equation that we've developed multiple times now. M times U double dot, right, where that's a nodal displacement acceleration, plus the stiffness matrix K, this is obviously still in the linear form, uh, times U uh, is going to be equal to zero in this case, okay? Let's go ahead and call this equation nine, right? This is a, effectively the same thing that we had with the spring mass system. We could put a force on this uh, zero vector, right? Maybe I should make that a vector just so it's clear. Okay, we could make this a zero vector or we could make this a force, it's a driving force, but we still have to solve the homogeneous problem just like we did before. Okay, so, but as with 1D, we're gonna go ahead and assume a, a, a solution form. Uh, we're going to assume a solution with with a sinusoidal form. Okay, now we could we could have a cosine too, but but we're going to come up with the same solution, and it just complicates the problem. So let's say that we're going to say that the vector u, the nodal displacement vector u, is going to be equal to uh, some normalized uh, no, uh, a normalized displacement vector u bar, right? Whatever that happens to be, times sine of omega t, okay? And so uh, and I'll just say here, let's call this equation 10 and say where u bar is a normalized uh, displacement, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means that I can take the second, uh, two derivatives, I can find the u double dot, okay? So then uh, we can write the second derivative as u double dot, you take that twice and you, you're going to get a sign, a negative sign out, negative omega squared times, I should say, uh, times this u bar vector, which is just a, a set of constants, right? Uh, times sine of omega t. Let's call that equation 11. So we'll go ahead and substitute 10 and 11 back into equation 9. And when we do that, we end up with the following. We end up with uh, k minus omega squared times m times uh, u bar times uh, the sine of omega t uh, is equal to zero. Call that equation 12. What can we say about equation 12? Well, we know that this, this has to be true for all values of t. So since sine varies in time, then the, the prefactor on that sign must be equal to zero, okay? Because equation 12 must hold for all time. We can write the following. We can then say that, that this prefactor term, k minus omega squared times m times u bar, uh, must be equal to zero. Call that equation 14. Uh, sorry, let's call this equation 13. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to pre-multiply by m inverse. Uh, and I end up with the following, that m inverse times k uh, minus omega squared. m inverse times m is just the identity matrix i times u bar equals zero. Well, I hope you, you kind of recognize what equation 14 looks like. It turns out equation 14 is the classic eigenvalue problem. Uh, so in this case, uh, here omega squared is the eigenvalue corresponding to an eigenvector u bar. Um, and these are eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix M inverse times K. Okay, so, so I wrote this. Note the similarities to the 1D case. Okay, so what else could we observe? Well, we can observe that for an N degree of freedom system, 
we're going to have an n by n m matrix and an n by n k matrix and those are going to yield n eigenvalue eigenvector pairs okay so what else can we say is that per equation 10 omega represents the frequency and and this u bar the eigenvector that corresponds to it right that represents the mode shape associated with that frequency so what what should you remember remember that u bar is simply a normalized displacement of all the nodes right so it has a shape to it right okay let me give you a couple of remarks on how we use this number one let's suppose I have a large system let's say a million degrees of freedom right and we can debate whether that's large or not but let's suppose it's, it's pretty big right that means we have effectively 1 million uh, eigenvalue eigenvector pairs we have 1 million modes do we care about all those modes well well no we don't what modes do we care about we care about the modes that are near the frequencies that we're loading or who have periods um, near the time frames that we're loading we care about those and and um, uh, frequencies that are lower than that okay so let me let me just make sure that that you're aware of that so we don't need every single uh, frequency in the system to, to get a pretty good solution so we typically only worry about um, uh, modes with frequencies um, near frequencies near our loading frequency or modes that have periods near uh, the period of loading okay uh, or uh, frequencies that are lower or periods that are longer right so for example let's suppose you were doing a cyclic load uh, maybe um, let's say 20 hertz 20 hertz or something like that so here's just a, a just an example uh, if you were applying a cyclic load of 20 hertz so F, I'll call it applied. Let's say that that was equal to 20 hertz. All right, if you're doing that, you're probably only going to care about frequencies that are uh, maybe 80 hertz in the system. So modes that are 80 hertz in the system, uh, you know, and then lower than that 20 hertz. Okay. So you want to make sure that you capture or that you model uh, rather modes with frequencies uh, maybe from maybe uh, less than let's say 80 hertz right you don't care about frequencies that are um, 2000 hertz or something like that okay so practically so this is this is uh, remark number two practically if you're using something like abacus uh, you're going to select uh, either and i'll just say this is like an abacus for example you're going to select either uh, number one, uh, the the lowest um, n modes of uh, for extraction, uh, and so if, you ha if you're trying to run um, uh, a, a frequency analysis on your system, you try to run it. You are almost always going to have to say tell the the um, FEA package what modes you want. It's not going to try to output. Uh, 1 million um, uh, modes and their associated frequencies. So usually maybe you care about the first, the lowest 20 modes, for example. Or if you know really that you have a specific loading frequency or load time, maybe you know exactly what frequencies that you care about. So you're going to either select the lowest number of modes for extraction, so you know, pick 20 or something, uh, or uh, you're going to say modes up to some specified frequency. Okay? I'll also just remind you... Uh, you know, this, this isn't, we're not doing, I'm not setting up a lab or something to do this, but um, just be aware that if you're doing a, a vibration analysis on uh, a structure that's unconstrained, then in particular you have rigid body modes, then you'll end up having, uh, you know, rigid body vibrations that have a zero frequency. So, so don't freak out if you don't constrain it, you're asking what the natural frequency is and you find out that you have, um, uh, you know your first your first set of modes are all all have zero frequency values that's because those are those are the rigid body modes okay just be aware of that so now now that we've kind of explained that explained what these are i think we're ready to move forward and talk about other types of uh, dynamic modeling but this this usually is uh, where we need to uh, ground ourselves